What's up, my friends? Thank you so much for joining us back here. Uh, we are going to jump right into the podcast today. I am speaking with Tracy Myers, the lead private investigator on the Dina McCann case. Now, if you're unsure of what you're getting into here, please do me a favor. Go back to episode one. Uh, this is the cold case of Dina McCann. She's a young lady who went missing from California in December of 1981. No one has seen her since the, the last person who saw her. And we are going to get into that right now. This is going to be the first episode and interview um, with Tracy, who's a fantastic person. You're going to meet her in this episode and uh, we're going to get right into it. Make sure that you are subscribing and ringing the bell because every week uh, until we get up to the point where we are right now in real time, um, we're going to be releasing an episode every week. So um, without further ado, let's get into it. Let's go. Hi, and welcome, everybody. My name is Scott. I'm a medium and a psychic. I am working with Tracy here on the cold case of Dina McCann. Now, to remind you, Dina went missing over 40 years ago in December of 1981. Her family was on vacation. She was at home, and she was her family was alerted by her older sister, who was in town but did not live with her, that nobody had been home at the McCann residence for what looked like several days. The family came home early from their vacation and they started an immediate search for her. They got law enforcement involved and even with such immediate action, they were unable to locate her anywhere. We fast forward many years and many twists and turns later and this is where I'm involved. And even before my involvement, we have this young lady right here, Tracy, who is the driving force of this entire investigation and what i'd like to say before i let tracy introduce herself is that when families are in need and they don't have the tools it's important for them to reach out law enforcement was unable to help them they couldn't help themselves and after 40 years the family was as i have hinted to in, in the opening of this looking for any answer um to help bring their sister and their daughter home so before they turned to someone like me, who's the supernatural paranormal, they did the very right thing of going into to somebody who's well equipped um, and has experience in this sort of thing. And that's where Tracy comes in. So, Tracy, welcome to uh, the first episode, our first interview. Um, of course, everybody, uh, I'm very good friends with Tracy now after all of this. Um, but I want to let her tell you a little bit about herself. So, um, Tracy, how'd you get involved in uh, helping the McCann family with all of this? Okay, first of all, hi, Scotty, and hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, I got involved working cold cases um, years ago, back in the 80s. Um, a childhood friend of mine had been um, kidnapped and or went missing, let's just say went missing. And we searched for, her, searched for her from the 80s, and we finally found her body in 2012. Uh, she was a victim of the Central Valley Speed Freak Killers, of Lauren Herzog and Wesley Sherman Tyne. And we accumulated a core group of people that worked on that investigation aside from law enforcement. We didn't have a very open door policy with uh, law enforcement at that time. And so we ended up working with a retired special agent, a retired homicide detective, bounty hunter and private investigator, um, a senator, and then me. I was, the, I'm the research person. I kind of have a propensity for documents. And that's kind of my forte. And so we all worked on those cases with the Speed Freak Killers for, like I said, almost almost 20 years. We have a, a podcast on that now, too. That's out. If anybody's interested, they can talk to Scotty. But um, originally, um, the senator that worked out on our team, Kathleen Galgiani, she had a cousin that was missing. And her name was Dina McCann. And this is a case we're speaking about. And the first thing that struck me about Dina's case, as far as that we were thinking it was possibly a speed freak killer um, case, is that, you know, Dina looked a lot like a couple of their victims. My friend Cindy had blonde hair, kind of short hair, the same build. Um, Chevelle Wheeler, who was also a victim of the speed freak killers, the blonde hair, the feathered, you know, the feathered look. And Dina looked a lot like those too. So when it, at first, 
at first look at it, 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 it was a possibility, you know, just from a type that possibly uh, Dina could be one of their victims. However, they didn't end up with a type. They ended up killing all, all sorts of people. Um, that and a rumor, uh, a rumor came out that um, supposedly Dina had come into contact with the Speed Freak killers at a gas station somewhere and that the gas station attendant had seen two men harassing her and then she seemed to know these gentlemen and left and went and left with them and then nobody ever saw her again so that kind of fit the speed freak killer thing too we heard it in as a uh, in regards as to that it was lauren and and wes at that time uh rob who's our our bounty, our bounty hunter and PI, who is just the most amazing investigator. Um, I had a hard time with it because that would have put those boys at like 15 years old, 16 years old. And um, not that they weren't capable, but to uh, keep a murder covered up or with no clues for 40 years takes a little bit of experience. And so I didn't really think that at 15 or 16 years old that uh, those two could possibly have kept that secret or not made any mistakes or not let any evidence behind or, or, or whatever. Right. So that's how it started. So we're going to talk a little bit about that gas station incident as well, because that was a rumor and it was a rumor that we think may have been started by an act by another medium or psychic, right? Right. That is exactly what happened. Now I don't, I'm not going to forget it. Uh, if you saw my art eyes darting around, I was looking for a, uh, my piece of paper so that I could write it down so I we don't forget about it to talk about it because I think that's a pretty crucial piece of evidence. Um and one that before we talk about the next piece is very important for the audience to remember is that um I find it very important that everybody knows that I don't go around looking for cold cases. I don't involve myself in anything, um interject myself. And if somebody asks me, I am reluctant myself to get involved, but this family had made such a strong case um, that I decided that I would go ahead and, and try to get involved. But this gas station rumor that we'll talk about in a little bit uh, started and with no ill intent, I don't believe, um, by another oh, medium no, no, or no. Psychic, um, whom we don't have the name of right now. Uh, but we do have record that it happened. Um, we'll talk about how that can really lead an investigation in the wrong way. OK, so. Um, we had the cold. We had the Speed Freak Killers. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, it's uh, the name of that podcast, if I remember correctly, is Maps, correct? Yeah, it's it's the Maps okay. on Foul Play. The Maps on Foul Play. So it, I've listened to the entire thing. It's in, it's very intriguing. Uh, it was very well done as, as a podcast. So if anybody's interested in some other true crime while they're waiting for us, and you really would like a setting of the things back then and how they were, um, the people who are interviewed were personally involved in this, uh, victims, family members, and, uh, even Tracy here, who was at, at the time a child herself when all this was going on. So if you listen to that, it will really set the stage as to why they may have thought that Dina McCann herself was the victim of these people and how later on in this case that we're talking about now, how it sort of ties in anyway, in a very strange way. So prior to me being involved um the mccann family uh comes to you and they say hey look we're looking for some private investigators to help us um look for our sister how how are you getting involved so we know your experience how how did you get involved with this now well we had um we had kind of earned a little bit of a reputation of being tenacious and um straight shooters and um I think another thing that gave us some credibility is we do not charge people when we uh, work on their cases. Uh, we don't feel like charging victims of uh, or family members of victims. I don't feel comfortable charging them to find out what happened to their loved one. I think that's actually abhorrent, to be honest. But um, so we had gained a little bit of a reputation, um, and I did as well, just because I am tenacious by nature and probably a little bit too aggressive. Um, I, I wouldn't an... say that. I've seen you at work. You did make me nervous a little bit, but <laughs> only in the best way. <laughs> but uh, and a little bit of an obsessive personality. Um, so we were uh, campaigning for a, a, a sheriff, a new sheriff election, and we were at a dinner. 
And so Dina has two identical twin brothers, Lance and Vance. And Lance approached me at that dinner and said, you know, uh, I'd like you to uh, take a look at my sister's case. And I looked at him and I'm just like, oh, gosh, because as I was explaining to you earlier, when I take on somebody's case, it becomes part of who I am. Uh, it's it's a never un, never ending narrative running in my head all day, every day. Um, and uh, that's when I started with my document. Anyways, to give that pledge, I knew what it was going to take for me mentally, emotionally, energy wise. I knew uh, some of the walls of justice I was going to have to fight to get answers. And I knew, you know, how much the investigation takes. And, you know, there's a lot of coordinating, you know, Rob lives in Roseville and he's part of our private team. So yeah, bounty hunter, private investigator, Rob Dick, um, retired homicide detective, Alan Fox. And then I'm, I'm the researcher. So, I mean, you know, and right. Alan so this is a super legitimate outfit. Like you got a retired <laughs> homicide detective. You have one of the best, I don't know. Do they like to be called bounty hunters? Is that still a thing? Um, Rob would like, rather be called a bounty hunter than a bail agent. Cause bail agent just doesn't cover it, you know? Okay. And, so and him being a bounty hunter, he is very good at finding people. Right. I've heard some of what this gentleman has gone through and who trained him. Uh, if he, Leonard, if you're yeah. missing or you owe someone money, you don't want this guy looking for you. <laughs> he's yeah. going to find you. And right. you don't want Tracy getting the documents or the trails you that don't. might lead you because she's very good at finding the, the theme of things in the paperwork. So um, you're at this dinner. Um, at and this dinner, he asked me, gave, gave me his card. And I was like, you know, I was really hesitant to uh, give any kind of affirmative uh, answer to him about that. Um, the election happened. Pat got uh, elected to San Joaquin County Sheriff's Office. You know, he got his own cold case, cold case team started at the county and things were kind of moving along. Um, I had met Shane Waters, who is the podcast host for um, Foul Play. Um, I met him doing The Keepers on Netflix. I did some research on on that Netflix series, and Shane has done the podcast on it for about four years on the Sister Kathy murder um, with the Archdiocese. And he was coming to the close at the end of that, and he was like, "I need another, I need another case." You know, he says, "Like, let's do, let's do a Speed Freak Killer thing." And I was like, "Oh wow!" I was like, "Okay." So we ended up doing a big old series podcast on the Speed Freak Killer cases. And at the end of that, or it, during that, in the back of my head, although I didn't know whether Dina was a speed freak killer victim or not, I remembered Lance asking me. And so I called Lance one day and I said, hey, why don't you come over? I've got these guys. They've flown in from back east uh, to do a podcast. Um, let's hear your story. So uh, he came over and uh, we recorded the episode with him about his sister and from that day forward started, I mean, it was a waterfall of emotions and information. It was like the universe was waiting for somebody like us to just open up. And at the end of that uh, podcast, after the microphones had been shut down, um, Lance gave me a name and he said, uh, I would like you to either clear this person or find out if this person is responsible uh, for my sister. And that's what started everything. Okay. So now you're, you're involved. You're emotionally involved. hooked into this one. And that's what it takes. It's somebody who cares. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know, um, you're going to know that Tracy cares tremendously uh, for the people that she gets involved with. Um, and again, the families who are at a dead end rely on people who have a passion and a drive um, to help this happen. So you guys are involved now. In the meantime, somewhere in between that time and uh, the next time, I guess, all this kind of comes back together. Um, that same brother, Lance, calls me. Well, he doesn't call me. He finds me on Instagram of all places. Right. And he sends me this photograph. And, and if you've listened to episode one, good if you haven't go back and listen to it it just tells about how i did this reading um and how i completely thought that i bombed it and i told tracy this and she thought it was hilarious um i again i don't do cold case fi files for for the reason that the type of mediumship that i do is evidentiary which means that when someone's loved one comes through they're going to bring specifics about themselves so 
if there's a bunch of unknowns in a cold case, how can I validate those things um, without somebody already knowing them, right? So when I gave all this information to Lance, not once did he indicate that I was on the right trail. And while I was giving him this information, I was like, I guess that this isn't going to work because it, he doesn't know enough about what I'm talking about or I'm completely wrong and he's just not going to give me any information, which is totally fine. So um, Lance, as it turns out, is a very smart man and he records the reading and he sends it over to you. And I assume that you you listen to it. I think you told me in like within a couple of days or so. I did listen to it within a couple of days. And, um, you know, at, at that by that time, we had a very clear suspect in our head with a profile that we had set and we had a lot of evidence to support our theory. And so uh, he sent it to me and I listened to it and I was just like, man, this just doesn't this doesn't fit anything that none of the facts. And it and at, the, at the time, it really at that point, it didn't feel true to me yet, you know, but right. part of my obsessive personality is, is, and this is the reason that I'm so uh, stuck to documents. I will read my documents over and over and over and over and over again. So for me, it starts with a question. So I'm asking a question of the document. When I read these documents, all I'm looking for is the information that answers that particular question. And so as other questions come up, I always end up back at these documents over and over again, and they never fail me. I always find something uh, that I didn't find before, or it's like a big bomb went off. And I was like, how come I didn't recognize that before? But so I was listening to your interview and I was uh, driving to and from this other psychic and, and I'm listening to this interview. And all of a sudden we came upon some, information from the actual suspect himself that there was somebody else that could possibly have been involved in the disappearance and murder of Dina. And when we got that information and we dove into that a little bit and found out who that person was, I then again, as like, like my documents, listening to your interview over and over again. And all of a sudden, like, it's just like I said, fireworks went off because every single impression that you gave was describing the second person that could have been involved. Yeah. And yeah. And all what I didn't know a year before that made me see, feel like, Oh, that's off. That's not even close. A year later, you know, time means everything. I had a bunch of different information and then listening to that now it absolutely fit. You know, it's like I said, time means everything. And I'm just so, yep. That's one thing I'm glad about that I do is that I go back and reread things or I go back and listen to things over and over because you never know at a different point in the investigation what you're going to need to hear. So right. when I heard that, I could not get home fast enough. I called Lance and I was like, where'd you find this guy? And he's like, I don't know. I don't know. I go, what do you mean you don't know? You know, and I was like, well, you got to find him. You got to find him. And this went on for a couple of weeks till I finally called him on the phone. I was like, look, go home, go in your room, shut the door. Let's get on the phone and see if you can find it. So we went through and Lance is a realtor. So he's got more contacts than God. And but, he's a good realtor at that. So. <laughs> and he found your info. Well, he, he just told me who you were. And from there, it's just, like I said, I'm led when it comes to documents and finding information. And I, I found you very quickly. So with that, um, for our, for our viewers, um, and for those not listening at home, I'm going or for those listening uh, on the actual podcast version of this. I'm going to tell you that behind Tracy is this map. Oh. This map is is old, and around the map are all these notes. Behind Tracy, that nobody can see, is an actual calendar, and there are handwritten notes by our victim. Now, one of the things that we find completely astonishing about this young woman is. She was one of these people that there's no doubt in my mind that if she was a teenager in today's society, she would be on Instagram, she would be on TikTok, and she would be documenting every moment of her life through a vlog or some sort of uh, interface that people would get to know her because she had diaries with handwritten notes. She yeah. had calendar, like calendars that were filled up every day with in crazy detail. And we will get into how all that plays. So where did all of this stuff come from? Where did that map, where did these notes and everything come from? Well, so uh, 
how things start, you know, for us is, you know, we interview one person, they say, oh, you should talk to this person, you should talk to that person. And so, you know, what had happened for us at this time, and it was really uh, fortunate, was COVID happened. And so Rob was home all day because he couldn't do, you know, right. Rob was home, Alan was home, I was home. So we were working this case sometimes eight to 12 hours a day for a year, you know. And so um, I lost my train of thought. Would you ask me? I'm sorry. You guys being home and I asked you where the box came from with all the information. Oh, okay. so, yeah. So we were interviewing people. And um, so, like I said, Lance has a twin brother, Vance. And he says, you know what? He said, um, there's this this girl that used to be really good friends with my parents. And she says that she has uh, a plastic box full of my dad's stuff that she thinks might have had something from when my dad was trying to investigate my sister's case years ago. So Rob goes to pick it up and it was just, you know, it's their the dad treasure, was the treasure trove of information from yeah. the investigation in 1981. And These nobody all... looked at that box at all. You know, notes, and years. somehow it wasn't even in the family's possession. Exactly. Somehow an adjacent person has it for some reason. How that happened, we don't exactly. know. But like so crazy. many, and then for it to have survived, you know how many right. times I've moved in my life and I'm like, well, this is old junk. Now I don't know why I would have done that with that, but if it wasn't pertinent to me, there's a very good chance I would have tossed it out because I'd have been like, nobody wants this. It wasn't relevant. It wasn't useful. It's trash. I just didn't know how somebody could keep a hold of a box from something that, you know, you knew was from a missing persons and just never look in it or never tell anybody. I was just blown right. away by that. But then again, timing is, timing is everything, like I just said. And so timing and relevance. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It had to go to the right people. So, so that is so amazing to me. Um, so now, yeah, that's the map from that box. All that paperwork yeah. is Dina's father's investigation. So, so for, if you're listening to this on the audio version, um, you can go up on my Instagram. I'll put a couple of these photos up so you can take a look at it. It's very red string on the wall um, <laughs> sort of set up um, in order to try to help connect the dots. Now, you had found that box after my reading? No, no, no. This is before. <clears throat> okay. This, this was before. You even I was all confused as to when. About a year yeah. into the investigation. Okay, I was a little confused as to when you had possession of the box, and then when I came in. So the box came first, then my reading, then our our suspect, our main suspect, gives some information that puts my reading into that. Like, oh wait a minute, there might be somebody else, and this guy described him. Well, however, what was more remarkable for me was um, when you started focusing on the investigation is that you gave almost the exact locations as Dina's dad's investigation did 40 years later. That's what was remarkable to me right. is that, you know, when you would, ju you jumped on, you're like, you're highlighting this area and this area. And I'm just like, how does this guy know this? There's just, there was no right. possible way, you know? So that's when I was really just like, you know, we we have we have got to see if he can help us do this because it was just remarkable to me that 40 years later that you could pull up the exact same sites and the exact same maps and got the same feelings as as what her dad um her dad had and i tell you boy i wish you were around when her dad was doing this because he sure needed the validation poor guy I yeah mean, yeah it was it oh, was well, oops i don't know, know what happened you're okay you got a little dark yeah sorry so it's okay. Um, but we'll talk about how he also had a, another, um, another, another medium or psychic that gave some locations that while Tracy and I were driving, when I went to California and we were driving around, we had a lot of like, oh my God, I can't believe that. Look at this landmark. That makes sense. Look at yeah. this. And it, not for me, but more specifically my landmarks we already had found. But then we looked back at this other mediums reading and we were like, Look at this. Look at this. She was on the right track. She the was on the right track. She, one thing that made the reading, I think, to me, really special was I don't know Lodi, California. Right. I know it a little bit now because I was there, but in New Jersey, there's nothing, no knowledge that I had. It's not like I was from, like, if you asked me to do a reading on somebody missing from here, I could rattle off 15 landmarks and you'd be like, well, you know the area. So, you're just going to name things, right? right? But in Lodi, 
I named things that I could never have known. It was, um, it was, it was remarkable. It, it really, really, really was. I just, wow. It was, it was a lot, but so when you got involved, um, is when I think the investigation really solidified for me, um, during that, right before you got involved or maybe it was right afterward, our suspect actually died and we were devastated yeah. by that fact because we really hoped that, uh, you know, Dina's mom is still alive. Dina's brothers are still alive. Dina's sweet sister is still alive. And we had hoped that they would get to see somebody um, prosecuted. We did get that in the speed freak killer cases where the victim's family members got to see them prosecuted. But unfortunately, um, he passed away uh, without us proving anything. And so where you were so important to me was I felt like the only thing I could bring the family then was possibly Dina's remains. Right. Which, and so that's why it meant so much to have you involved. Hopefully we will get there. Um, so I'm going to briefly skim over some of that reading again. If you haven't listened to episode one, um, please go back and do that. But one of the most important things that came out during all this is I really did feel as though I had bombed the whole thing, um, which when I sit in this chair and I, first off, I'm going to tell you something funny about where I initially had done the reading. I, I, I skimmed over this in the first episode. I actually was out somewhere and I got the message from Lance and he asked me to do the photo reading and I was compelled to stop and do the reading. So I looked at the photograph, I grabbed my phone, I took my notes so I wouldn't forget it. And then when I got home, I sat in this chair and I reread the notes to Lance so he had them. Um, and then I tapped in a little bit and gave some more information. But the initial reading where it was done is so, I, this is gonna be funny for everybody who doesn't know this. I, where I live in Middletown, New Jersey, there's a, a liquor store called, and this is funny how it says, it's called Circus Liquors. No way. I miss, they have, I don't remember that. They have a giant clown out front. I stopped because it's a big open parking lot. It's easy to get to off the highway. So I parked there and I was just doing the reading. And on the front of this very large building is a, what are they called? What, what's the thing called where the grapes grow? Vineyard. The vineyard, yeah. So that is on the front of this building. So I'm sitting in a parking lot surrounded by a circus theme and a vineyard. Two things that later on in this case, you're going to find out Huge. how insane that happened to be for all of this. So um, one day I'm, I'm, I don't know, I was probably up on the couch hanging out watching TV. Like that's my home away from home. And uh, Tracy calls and I'm like, California, who's this? I let it go to voicemail and she's like, Hey, this is Tracy. Uh, should I, I should go back and see if I still have that to play it? Um, and yeah, basically we're like, give me a call. You did a reading for these folks. And I called you back and we had a conversation. And, uh, as soon as the conversation was over, I ran up from this chair and I got to my wife and I said, <laughs> I didn't bomb it. I didn't mess it up. This, Remember this that nice reading lady, a year ago? <laughs> this, yeah. This lady from uh, California called you supported a, uh, an invest, a private investigation team. And, uh, she's telling me how right on everything was. And we had a very long conversation about everything that led to where we're at now. So let's take a real quick um, two seconds. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, uh, Tracy here is also a wonderful artist. And she works with epoxy and resin. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. And she has a um, wonderful shop that she runs out in California. So if you've ever watched any of those videos where people pour the ocean and then they cover it and there's waves and all the beautiful things. I'm going to put an overlay here for everybody to see when we're when they watch it. Um, Tracy does that stuff. And in order to help her um, be able to um, do all the wonderful things that she's doing for people, she needs an income. And this is how she makes some, some extra money. So if you would like to go visit her shop, um, you can do that. It's the C, say it for the C shop now. three on Instagram. And it's the C shop on TikTok and the C shop on Facebook. All right, so I'll put those overlays up here for everybody to see. Um, and basically, if you go there and you purchase something from her, um, that helps her um, be able to do all these other amazing things uh, for, for free for all these um, other causes that she's into. So um, this, we'll say, is sponsored by the Seaside. Seaside. <laughs> all 
Um, and by the way, I have some of my kids, the stuff that you sent home for my kids, they loved it. So oh, good. They, they, they like it. Played up on our, up on their uh -huh. counters. And, uh, my daughter especially likes it because she gets, she looks at that and she like talks about there being mermaids in there and like her old imaginations opened up. Definite mermaids. In there. With, with a little bit of, uh, that beautiful epoxy resin that you poured in there. Thanks. Scott. You're very welcome. Thank you. This is, um, for people listening, I think that it's gotta be pretty mind blowing that um where just a strange amount of events um stemming from a very unfortunate event led to us talking right now right. um so my question is and i think that people may want to know is what was the real piece of the reading that made you be like this is the way we have to go we have to get scott a little bit more involved your description of the suspect, hundred percent. The description of the suspect. Um, well, and it, see, it was it was Lance that was misguiding you in the reading because, you know, the first thing that you came out and said is, you know, you see like a football stadium, and Lance is just like, no. And then so I sure you were looking at California trying to see where a football stadium was or yep, or whatever, absolutely. you know what I mean? And you know, you guys put yourself in San Francisco, and what you didn't realize at the time was that. The last place Dina had been seen was she had drove up to Sac State where a friend of hers played football in the stadium for Sac State in Sacramento. And so immediately I hooked with, that's what he's talking about. He's, he's talking about Sac State and where the guy played football. And then the next thing you did is you brought up, you kept saying, you know, I, I see a Brenda Way, you know. And so I look and where's Brenda Way? It wasn't super super close but it was near the area of the stadium i'm like oh my goodness and then you started describing this guy with dark curly hair and kind of lanky and all this i'm just like and when i heard it the first time i was like i don't want to say our suspect's name do you want me to say our suspect's name just first name i was like that doesn't that doesn't describe ed you know but a year later you know ed himself had given me his accomplice, who I believe was his accomplice, and his right. name was Raul. And so you were describing Raul completely. And when those things happened just like that, and then you were describing the mentality of the two together and things like that, it just, it was, it was very clear to me that you were on the right trail more so than any um, other, probably, you know, I deal with a couple psychics, but, um, I usually have to give them a lot more information um, in order for them to connect to it. And I, that's what was astounding to me is that you were, you weren't, I didn't, I didn't give you any information on the case. And certainly nobody would, anybody that would have listened to your interview would not have understood the gravity of the information you had, unless you were me, Robert Allen. And so, but it, for those of you that work cases or want to work cases, I, I can't, stress enough how important it is to go back to your information over and over again because at different points in your in your investigation you're going to have different knowledge and different information and you never know what's going to fit later and this is a really good example of that and more so is that i i thought this was so interesting that um here is a bunch of level-headed headed people who are working with again uh, a, down, a very down-to-earth guy who hunts people down for a living. He's not relying on psychics and mediums. He re he's relying yeah, on true. eyewitness. He's relying on people giving the information, um, their habits, the things that would really help you track someone down if you needed to. And he's very, very good at it. Then you have a retired homicide detective, somebody who is certainly, in my experience, not listening to anybody like me. They're, that's they're true. again, that's true. Hard to, to the facts. I don't it's care about faith your... in me that considers you. <laughs> right. Um, so that was really important as well because, but it, but also I think um, we had discussed this and, and I'll say it again now is that um, at the end of the first reading, I told Lance that I don't believe that mediums and psychics solve cases. That's Good right. Police work, eyewitnesses and paper trails, all those sorts of things are what will solve a case. Somebody like me is a good tool to use but certainly not the person who's going to bring that person uh out for them or, and or that gave you credibility to them that really gave you credit just that statement alone and you know, I, because I, it's how it should be used and i totally i stand by that even now 
Um, where it's going to really, because it's not one person that will ever do it anyway. It's got to be a teamwork. It's got to be tenacity. It's got to be a drive and a caring um, and really just keep pushing for the truth. And as we go through this, digging for the truth um, sometimes can be a little bit dangerous. We can get thrown off course um, and we could end up in places that had, in a very strange way. And for anybody who might be listening to this for a little bit of the paranormal besides the mediumship, Tracy here got a little bit of a taste when I got there and I did and then like nobody fed me information. I did not feed into anything that was happening to her during this investigation. We're going to talk about that in the next episode. So before we get to that, what is the goal of this investigation from here? Since we think that our suspect is deceased, but I, we I, will I, remain open-minded that there may be somebody still involved that knows something or who was actually involved that could possibly still be alive. So we'll leave that open. Um, to bring Dina home, you know, to, to find her remains, to find out what happened to her. Um, I, you know, people like to use the word closure when they're talking about cold cases with people. And I'm very hesitant to use that because I really don't believe victims, family members ever have closure. But to fi- but to find to know some answers to the questions is better than never knowing anything at all. And right. so I believe, uh, you know, as a mother, two of my daughters are terminally ill and they're very young. One's 21, one's 24. But I tell you what, if they pass away, I know how I know why I know when I have some control over celebrating their life or letting them go. And Dina's mom doesn't have that, you know? And so I can really empathize, I really empathize with her on a very deep level about the loss of a child, but I can't understand how hollow and how empty and how alone it is to not know anything at all. I believe if we can find her, that it will prove that we're correct about our suspect. Yeah. And I think that's what the boys need. That's what the twins need. And, and their sister is they really needed to know who did it. And, and I believe we found the person who did it. I also want to believe that. Um, however, I will remain open-ended on it because we don't have any proof yet. Maybe, we'll, right. find some, maybe we'll find some physical evidence uh, as we go down the line here. So I'm going to wrap this up. I want everybody, if you haven't done this yet, please uh, like this episode, subscribe. If you're listening to it on uh, any place that you can listen to podcasts, please do whatever it is that you have to do to follow a podcast. Um, If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit the little bell so that you know when we upload a new episode. Uh, We're going to try to bring at least one to you every single week uh, until we get to the point where we are back into the active investigation. Because I probably should have mentioned this in the beginning. This is still ongoing. We haven't gotten the closure we're looking for yet, but we are at a point where a return to California is imminent and we're going to do some more physical investigation. So, Tracy, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having Um, me. Again, please visit uh, Tracy. I'll leave some links down in the comments uh, or in the show notes, and you'll be able to visit the C-Shop, check out her wonderful work and support her and in turn helping support uh, these efforts moving forward. Um, we really appreciate you. Thank you so much. And uh, stay tuned and let's let's bring Dina home. Thanks.